that we all appear to be one consciousness and that there is only one mind and that what the what the universal conscious, consciousness seems to have done is divided itself into trillions and trillions, maybe even Googles of entities, so it can uh, you know, subjectively observe itself and experience itself as many different objects and things and people and everything else. From every perspective, even a blade of grass or a rock. And so when you look at that on a large scale, you realize the same thing with the human mind. Our human mind is encased in darkness and it has senses, the five senses. Those five senses are what gives, gives the brain the data. So for us human beings, for example, we are a part of a sensory system for the main consciousness and we're out here gathering data and transmitting it back to the main source as above so below it's all fractals i believe that there are podcast episodes and people that open up your mind to new ideas but then I believe that there are podcast episodes and people that completely shatter and alter your perception of reality. This episode is one of the latter because introducing our guest, Billy Carson, it almost starts to feel overwhelming for me to begin to introduce someone like Billy because he is a true polymath in every sense of the word. He's an MIT alumnus with a certificate of science with a focus on neuroscience, but not only that, he is an expert on topic, topics ranging from hermetic sciences to hidden technologies from past civilizations. What's interesting about Billy is that he's a true field researcher, meaning that he doesn't research these things behind a computer. He actually travels and puts in the work to go to these ancient sites, the pyramids in Egypt, Machu Picchu in Peru, and absorb the wisdom and knowledge from the people that understand the stories, not the stories that have been given to us by the media or through history books, but the true word of mouth stories that these Aboriginal uh, tribes have held with them for thousands and thousands of years. What we're about to present in this episode is a new human story. You're going to learn things like how to actually manifest through frequency, how to understand what really happened to the human race. Did we get intervened by alien races? These are topics that I would love to open a portal for us to dive into with an open mind and heart. The core of this podcast is is to stay open and explore new ideas because if you're here right now, if you're tuning into this frequency, which Billy and I, we embedded this show with frequencies that are very high, you are ready for this information and humanity is ready for this information. That's why we're here. We're here to seed new ways of thinking and new ways of being in the world because the paradigms right now are no longer functioning. So we have people like Billy that I have the blessed opportunity to introduce you to that are changing the game. And through their work, through their investigations, they are giving humanity a new map to the future and what is actually going on. Billy has been featured as a regular guest on Gaia, Travel, History, and Discovery Networks. He's even exploring secret space programs, ETs, ancient anomalies, potential human origins, and he's the CEO of a first-class space agency. What hasn't Billy done in this lifetime? Um, as the founder of Forbidden Knowledge right now, he is focused I'm bringing hidden truths to the mainstream public so that we can get empowered and we can learn our true potential that we hold in this vessel, in this lifetime as souls living a human experience. So I am humbled to introduce you to this episode. Uh, Billy said at the end that it was one of the best interviews that he's ever done. And I say that with such a humble energy. Um, and I encourage you, if you believe the same, if this is something that blew your mind, subscribe to this channel, this podcast, leave a comment, like this episode, share it with your community, and 
Let's start getting forbidden knowledge out to the mainstream. Much love. Billy Carson, welcome to the podcast, brother. What are you most excited about right now in your life? Right now, I'm really excited about the opportunity that I've been blessed with and been given to be able to spread knowledge globally, uh, working on a lot of independent films, independent documentaries, independently produced TV series, and trying to gather all of the great minds from around the world and bring them to my TV network so that I can let the masses get access to information that the mainstream just won't put out for whatever reason. I love that. And I fully resonate with your mission, brother. And it's such a true honor to be here. Um, you Thank hold you. so Same much, here. so much sacred wisdom. Uh, and for the past, what is it, 30, 40 years, 30 years, yeah. you've been studying this work and yeah. going deep into sacred knowledge, ancient knowledge, ancient technologies. From the age of one, you were already reading mm -hmm. books, right? And yeah. You've yeah. had a couple of encounter experiences that I know we'll get into a little bit later, yeah. but I wanted to start off because I know that there is a pulse right now in the mm -hmm. world that we're seeing yeah. and something new is emerging. And mm -hmm. you've been studying this because even from the tablets of the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, they were telling us about this time in humanity, this yeah. new birthing of a, of a new human, uh, of mm -hmm. a new time. So I wanted to ask you from your perspective, looking in, yeah. What is this pulse that's going on in the world right now? Well, right now we're at the perfect time. We're on the precipice where we can go toward this usher toward this golden age, or we can go back down into the dark depths. I feel like we're really teetering to the side that's moving back towards that golden age. I really feel like we're in the Tetra Yuga, which is the silver part of the silver age, the beginning of the silver age, heading back towards the golden age. Mm -hmm. And Thoth talked about this in the Emerald Tablets, and he talked about uh, putting out this wisdom and this knowledge, not for the people of his current era, but for a time far in the future where people can really digest, discern, understand, and conceptualize exactly what he was talking about and then put action behind it and bring it to fruition, make it an actual reality. Hmm. And the short version of it is, is us seeking the light and bringing heaven to earth, understanding that we have the capability and the power of being our co-creators in our reality and that we can choose the light. It doesn't always have to be dark. Uh, even though there is a, a balance of yin and yang, we can seek the light. And he said he watched civilizations around the universe rise and fall, and that we would be rising around this time. And that's exactly what's happening now. Hmm. And, and now that we brought up Thoth, I just wanted to give people a quick context. Who was this amazing being that lived on the earth uh, many, many years yeah. ago, 36,000 years ago? Yeah, amazing being. I mean, countless years he's existed. He is the son of Ea Enki, a former ruler here on Earth in ancient times, one of the original Sumerian pantheons. But these people were Anunnaki. They were beings from beings who came from heaven to Earth. That's what Anunnaki means. It doesn't mean they were a specific race. It means that they came from outer space and came to this planet in the distant past. Uh, he ruled over the land of Kem for 14,000 years, according to the Egyptians, not according to me. Yeah, That's an enormous amount of time. Uh, and, you know, these king's lists and records have been kept for eons. So it's well documented that uh, this was his thing. And then he's been known to the Greeks as Hermes and Mercury, you know, to the Romans. He's been uh, known as Quetzalcoatl and Kukulkan to the Mayans. And he developed the Teotihuacan culture. This this gentleman has literally uh, spanned the entire globe, bringing and teaching knowledge along with him. Uh, after the Great Flood, he started back in the land of Kem and his mission was to bring mankind back up to a high level of civilization, meaning we had already been there before, but we had forgotten, lost our way mm. after that geological catastrophe. And he was his mission was to bring us back. And he had spread his team around the entire planet to go on a mission just to do that. Yeah. And and I've heard you mention Thoth the Atlantean. So he was around, and you mentioned the land of Chem, which modern mm -hmm. day, it's, it's Egypt. Yeah. Uh, was this cataclysm that happened, are we talking about ancient Atlantis or are we talking about a different time period? We're talking ancient Atlantis. If you look at the time period that uh, he's talking about coming back and rebuilding, starting back in the land of Kem after the Great Flood, we're talking about a, a, a situation where obviously there was a global geological disaster which sunk the actual one, one of the actual capitals of Atlantis which is most likely in the Atlantic Ocean. 
hence Atlantis, Atlantic. Uh, and But that was just one capital of many. And that this may have been a targeted attack that created this disaster on Earth, but that there were many capitals around the entire Earth. And at some point, they commenced in some type of a global war, which didn't just span on Earth. It spanned from Earth to the moon and even as far out as Mars. Hmm. And and Thoth, he left behind these scriptures, these essentially cosmic laws for people um, yeah. of this age. Uh, we're beginning, and, and there was a man, um, I'm blanking on his name, but you you based a lot of the research on your book uh, mm-hmm. on him rediscovering these tablets, being guided yeah. by, by Thoth to rediscover them, bring them back to the pyramids. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to ask you, just like from all these cosmic laws, because there's so much in there. Yeah. What are some of the laws that you've investigated the most, the most that the ones that have most resonated with you mm-hmm. uh, that have impacted and influenced your current life, your present reality? What are those cosmic laws that we can all learn about? Yeah, definitely. We're talking about Michael Doriel. Michael Doriel. And so uh, these laws really became the comedic principles initially. Then they became known as the hermetic principles later uh, by the Greeks. And these principles, these laws, they govern the entire universe. And these laws are unimmutable, according to Thoth. And these laws, really, if you analyze them, they are what we now are talking about in quantum physics and quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And the first law is that all is mental. So this entire universe is one giant mind, and everything exists or starts with, first, the mind. Mm -hmm. And to prove this, the device that I'm using to talk to you and see you and speak to you right now and vice versa It all started off as a thought in a mind, a conscious thought, which then, so that was on the multidimensional platform, which then at some point went to a 2D platform where it was drawn out either by hand or on a computer. And then from there, it was given to an engineer to turn it into a three-dimensional object that can maneuver in space-time. And now we have a three-dimensional object that we can communicate through. And so, you know, it's pretty amazing that all this mind. The second one really is... um, the principle of uh, 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 as above, so below. And we see from the larger um, aspect of reality that we all appear to be one consciousness mm. and that there is only one mind and that what the what the universal conscious, consciousness seems to have done is divided itself into trillions and trillions, maybe even Googles of entities, so it can, uh, you know, subjectively observe itself and experience itself as many different objects and things and people and everything else from Mm -hmm. every perspective, even a blade of grass or a rock. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at that on a large scale, you realize the same thing with the human mind. Our human mind is encased in darkness and it has senses, the five senses. Those five senses are what gives, gives the brain the data. So for us human beings, for example, we are a part of a sensory system for the main consciousness. And we're out here, gathering data and transmitting it back to the main source Mm -hmm. as above so below it's all fractals yeah and then the most important one to me also is the principle of cause and effect and so we're seeing that every single decision you make and i mean every decision good or bad is going to have a consequence good or bad Mm -hmm. and so when you start to analyze every outcome pre-think every potential outcome because we know that the universe outcomes exist in superposition in quantum physics Multiple outcomes exist until you collapse one reality. And so when you start to think that way, all of a sudden you can collapse the reality that you want by making the right decision. So you have to travel in time with your consciousness to the future, analyze potential future outcomes, pick the one you want to happen, then travel back in time to your mind and make the right decision to create the future outcome that you want. Hmm. And, and we're talking about consciousness, and we also mentioned the brain. And it's really exciting because in a couple of days, we're going to have on uh, Eben Alexander, um, mm. near-death experience, um, one yeah. of the most <laughs> well-accounted in the world. And he used to believe that brain, without the brain, there's no consciousness. And then he went mm. brain dead for seven days, but wow. he traveled you know, realms and he remembered his whole experience. So... When mm. we talk about consciousness, what is beneath that that is not related to just the brain as an organ yeah. in itself? Right. That's an amazing epiphany he had because mm. the brain does not create consciousness. Mm. <laughs> the brain downloads consciousness. Consciousness is actually streaming in from higher dimensions, just like gravity 
is coming from higher dimensions. By the time it gets to the third dimension, gravity is extremely weak. Yeah. It's spanned through multiple dimensions. Our our same thing with our, with our consciousness. We're, it's actually coming from way much higher dimensions and it's streaming down. Now, this avatar body is literally encoded to pick up a specific dot frequency. In other words, I'm 99.1, you're 99.2, somebody else is 99.3. We're all coming from the same radio station. However, are fine-tuned to pick up a point dot number of that frequency. So this avatar encapsulates a specific a specific version of that frequency and encapsulates it temporally in time, temporary but temporally, into this avatar body for the purpose of us being able to animate it throughout its lifetime, then also then transmit back to source the information. So the consciousness is actually existing outside of us, yeah. not inside of us. Mm-hmm. We, we, we just went there. It's, it's Scorpio season. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Billy, I was, I was really curious because when we talk about the frequencies and that we can attune ourselves to certain frequencies, for example, this mm-hmm. morning, I was doing this meditation uh, by mm. Dr. Joe Dispenza called Synchronize Your Energy to Love. Mm. And, and it's amazing what happens because you get in this place where your pure consciousness, your pure awareness, and you start tuning into the, the station of whatever that frequency of love is, mm. or the same can be implied with abundance or mm. joy or gratitude. Um, I wanted to unlock that for people and, and, and allow you to explore that a little bit deeper, how we can synchronize our energy to certain yeah. frequencies and be able to attract in our life whatever mm-hmm. that specific frequency we intention to be. Oh, absolutely. You talk about love. That's what's the, high, that's the highest frequency. 528 hertz mm-hmm. uh, is the highest frequency you can get in terms of operating and maneuvering on this planet in complete and pure power mm-hmm. and understanding how to man- maneuver and wield that power but anything can be matched to a specific frequency. If you look at Albert Einstein's uh, theor- theory of relativity and you look at a graphic of it, you'll see like a planet in space and that planet in space is warping space time around it. Just like space time warps around our bodies, but the bigger the mass, the bigger the warping. Now what happens is when you have warped space time, objects in space will fall towards the largest mass. Okay, so this is how come asteroids and comets come streaming in toward the sun, Hmm. right? Because they're falling towards the sun. Now, take out the planet and put your consciousness in that spot. It's so powerful that you have the capability of warping space time with your consciousness. Hmm. And so if you perceive it that way, now, whatever you think of, whatever you're focusing on the hardest is warping space time and the things that you're focusing on fall directly toward you. You don't run out to seek and chase after these things. That's the wrong mentality. The right mentality is to attract. If you focus on attracting, then you reach something that very few people ever attain. You achieve the ability to understand the true power that's already inside of you and how to draw things to you like a magnet. And that's, so that's how I try to operate every single day. I don't try to chase. I try to attract. Yeah. And, and we've heard those cliche memes all over Instagram. Don't chase, attract, but it's literally what you're doing whenever you, yeah. you know, focus your intention and consciousness on a specific thing. I'd love to right. open the space for you to maybe tell a story of when that really clicked for you, when you created something and you became this magnet of whatever you were trying to attract because you've built incredible things from, you know, dot com companies to now right. your forbidden knowledge whole platform, yeah. which is is really amazing what you're doing right now. Thank you. Hmm. You know, it really started early for me. Uh, I would say I became first aware of my ability to control my destiny, so to speak, and attract what I needed when I was uh, living in Miami, Florida, very poor, desolate, no money, no money for the ice cream truck, which is what I saw my friends doing every single day. And I was like, how come they can go to the ice cream truck? And we're both neighbors and we're both poor. It seemed like they had so much more money than me because they were buying ice creams and pickles, all kind of stuff, and I couldn't get anything. I just wanted a bubble gum. And so one day I had enough, and I sat down, and I literally just kept thinking to myself, how can I change this? How can I have money to go to the ice cream truck? And I said, oh, I sell my toys. So I gathered up all my toys in an old Winn dixie milk crate, and I went door-to-door asking for donations, and I started giving away my toys for donations, a dollar, a penny, whatever. Telling the people, like, I just want some money for the ice cream truck. 
and people were giving me money. I gave my, my toys away, even the broken toys. I sold those too. And I took this famous picture of me holding the money in my hand. And that moment I realized I was going to be okay, that I was in control of my own destiny and that my actions would attract what I needed. Mm -hmm. And so my conscious thought back by action, put the money in my hands, which the next day then turned into my bubble gum. And I made that connection. Like it was like the epiphany. It wasn't going to be a one-off situation that just happened in my life. I realized this is how I'm going to live from this point forward. I'm never going to change this. This is going to work. I, I realized early in my life that this would work for anything I applied it to. Mm -hmm. And so I began to do my own thought experiments and I would apply this same technique to other things. Yeah. And it worked every single time. And I literally started to become a master at manifesting from a very, very young age because I had that fundamental principle at an early age and I just kept building on it and building on it. And the more I built on it, the more my belief system in myself became stronger and stronger and understanding my own true power and how to walk in my own power became stronger and stronger to the point now where, you know, I feel like I could manifest things almost instantly. I mean, I have to really be careful what I think now, because if I think the wrong thing or say the wrong thing, it comes almost instantaneously. So I have to be very thoughtful and mindful of my own words and my own self-talk. Huh. If you could summarize that principle that you learned at a young age in like a sentence or two, what, what would it be? Yeah. I would say that understanding that if you want to focus on something to become your reality, you first have to focus on it, but then figure out what is the action that's going to help you get to that end result. And if you can find the action needed and then take that action, the end result is going to come to you. And it's going to also open other new doors, other new avenues in your life that you never thought existed. And then you'll be able to manifest those things that you need and want. They'll come right to you right when you need them. And you'll be able to walk in abundance 24 seven. Yeah. And, and it's all, it's also right there when we hear like law of attraction, what are the final words of attraction, which is action, what you're saying, Actions. like you, we have to be inspired by that vision and then also yeah. take the necessary steps to, to go out there and, and, and attract and receive all that information and, right. and opportunities and doors that open. I wanted to ask you when you mentioned that whenever you think something and, and you have to be mm -hmm. sort of careful what you think, and this applies to everyone, um, yeah. when you manifest it quicker. Is this because essentially you're operating at a high frequency that every thought that you have, like I've, I've been at these Dr. Joe Dispenza mm -hmm. events and it's yeah. crazy what happens. Like, cause you're, you're elevating with a group, you're getting coherent with a group. Yeah. All of a sudden, you know, you say something and then things start happening and you mm -hmm. just start manifesting at a super quick pace. And this almost lasts, yeah. you know, the, the, the post retreat effect so right. <laughs> when we hear about raising frequency, mm -hmm. I wanted to explain that with a little bit of science so people understand what is actually yeah. going on in that. Sure, exactly. If you look at a person's consciousness, right, you connect a EEG to the brain, you connect some sensors, you plug it into a computer and you have them start doing random thoughts. So we'll start thinking about being sad or show them, show, show them photos of somebody that, uh, you know, that's sad or hurt or crying or, or, or ill or dying in a hospital. You can see that the frequency on the oscillation on the screen is going to be a very slow and wide frequency, a high trough uh, and a low valley, but it's going to be spread out. And what's going to happen is they're operating at a low frequency biologically. Yeah. You show people things that are energetic, happiness, excitement, joy, or get them to start saying those things. You're going to see the oscillations are going to be very, very tight and high and very close together, meaning that there's less space in between the cosine wave, which means they're operating at a high frequency. Their mind is at a higher frequency. They're in a different mind state. Mm. And so once you become a master at manifesting, you know how to flip a switch to get your mind into that, into that state almost immediately. And when you're in that state, anything you say or do is going to have an equal or opposite reaction somewhere in the universe. Mm. And so if you uh, are, you know, if, if I say, I said, for example, I said to Elizabeth the other day, uh, this a couple of months ago, we need to have a Forbidden Conscious Awards. Within a few minutes, she's like, I already have somebody working on the logo. The next <laughs> thing I know, I'm looking for venues. The next thing I know, we couldn't find one, but somebody contacted us. Now we got it. And it just kept going, boom, 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 right down the list. Now it's actually booked and happening. Mm. And so, you know, you have to be careful because that's a big commitment. It's a, you know, multi-hundred thousand dollar commitment to be into. So you have to be careful. Yeah. Well, now you got to do the work. 
You know, so you understand that the mind is so powerful when you get on that high frequency state and you understand how to trigger it and you understand that the mind is going to respond. High frequency is going to respond to a powerful mind and knowledge of self. If you are uh, confident, believing in yourself, not outside sources, you're not relinquishing your power away to other sources to give you vindication, then you're walking in a high frequency. Once you start begging, hoping, and wishing out for other sources, other deities, other people mm. to come in and save you, that's low frequency. Yeah. I even, I even heard you say in a lecture that when people were ha had these EEG machines on and they were hoping or essentially, you know, you know, praying for something outside of them to right. whatever happened, those waves were longer <laughs> and slower. Spread out split out yeah um, but when you yeah, know it's so happening true. when you say and and that's why in, in a lot of um like intention setting it ends with so it is yes. essentially saying it already had happened it already yeah. has happened in you know the quantum potentials and then right. the the brain waves and then that speeds up so speeds you know you can even see that connects. you can even see that through our brain and what's actually going on i wanted to ask you why are humans amongst the most coveted beings uh, in the galaxy? Well, if you look at the myth of Adapa, which is an ancient Sumerian uh, text, it's written about Adapa, who's actually Adamu, first man. It's the most advanced version of Homo sapiens sapiens, which is us. It talks about, these are the Anunnaki speaking. They say that the Adapa is created to be even higher than they are. We have a special genetic code inside of us that is very deceptive because initially it looks like, you know, we come out of the womb, we don't know how to speak, talk, we don't have no memories of, of, of past lives or information, we don't have any uh, genetics that pass on instantaneous knowledge for us like an animal would, and we have to learn everything from scratch, uh, and then we look feeble and weak and everything else, but all of a sudden, inside of us is a serious code and locked in that what they call junk DNA that they put there that will allow us to reconnect, reestablish, and even become higher in their eyes than they are, and that all the knowledge and wisdom of the universe is encoded into our bodies. And that's an amazing statement to be made. This is an ancient text. Anybody can look it up, the myth hmm. of Adapa. Hmm. Pretty powerful stuff. And I think that uh, human beings have are so have so much potential, a potential for love, for, potential for creativity, for, potential for uh, technological advances and, and empathy and everything else, that uh, we have the capability of being a, uh, uh, if you want to call it a, a footprint for what a being, a sentient being should look like and operate like, you know, uh, in, in the universe. And I think that we have the capability to reach back out to our, our brothers and our cousins in space. And we, can, we came from absolute zero and we're going to get back to hero. And I think that it's really interesting for them to operate and watch us. It's like how we go in the wilderness and we watch animals. Yeah. We watch them and we take videos of them and we put cameras in their dens because we want to see how are they operating? How are they living? And it intrigues us. And we, we, we alien abduct them by darting them and knocking them out. And then we take them and we put alien implants in them so we can track them. And I think this is kind of the same thing that's happening with us just because We've gone from a horse buggy and carriage in 100 years all the way to putting remote control cars on other planets. And even now we have Voyager, which has already left this in intergalactic space. So it's a pretty amazing accomplishment to do in 100 years. And I think it's a, it's a real amazement for them to see how far we can go in two, three, four hundred years. So we're being heavily watched. Mm. And, and even the most renowned scientists right now, like people like Michu Kaku, are saying and they're talking about connecting with you know, ET races, outer worldly races and, and species yes. and technologies. And you've had a couple experiences um, from from your end. And I wanted to ask yeah. you, like, where where is the current standing right now for you um, yeah. in terms of uh, the disclosure that's going on right now? Uh, and where is that headed in the future? Are we going to be making more contact? Are we already making contact? Where, where are we mm -hmm. at right now? I think it's really interesting. You know, my first UFO encounter was I saw one in my backyard when I was seven in Opelika, Florida, in Miami. And then the second time I had an encounter, which was the most mind boggling, boggling encounter in person yeah. in around 2010 in, uh, in Western Florida. In your house. Uh, and so hmm? you were in your house, right? 
when they- I was in my house. Yeah, I was in my house and uh, the whole room ch- changed into more of like a lavender color. And these what look like the typical alien grays came in the house. Uh, I didn't see them come in, though, because when I, I heard it, I, I saw the color and I heard the TV go down and I thought my kids were playing a joke. So I looked over my shoulder. When I turned around, they were just there. I don't I don't know how they got in, to be honest with you. But it scared me. I screamed. My voice was muted. Yeah. My brain was shaking. They were, uh, I don't know. It wasn't a telepathic communication yeah. that I could understand. But whatever they were doing was making my brain feel like it was shaking inside my skull. Huh. And then as quick as it started, it stopped. And they turned and they kind of dangled back yeah. out. But they went right through the wall. With hindsight, and I was wide awake. I wasn't even tired. With hindsight now, do you know why they chose to visit you on that day? With hindsight, I think it was two things. One thing is that's when I started my quest to understand quantum physics. Uh, I became like I had to, I was absorbing it like like you're drinking water. Uh, a person who just walked 20 miles in a desert needs a glass of water. I was like, I almost drank the glass, right? Mm. And then the second thing was, it, uh, in my mind, I kept hearing Worldwide Telescope over and over again, Worldwide Telescope. And so I went on Excite.com back then and I looked it up and it was uh, WorldwideTelescope.org was the first result. It was a software program back then. You downloaded it. Now you don't have to download it because of HTML5, but you downloaded it to your computer mm. and it, it gave you access to all the space probe data. And I went to, okay, well, Mars. And I said panoramas. And I went to Opportunity Rover. And the next thing you know, I was like, I was looking through the rover on Mars and I started seeing anomalies, things that didn't belong up there. And these images were unobfuscated. They weren't even altered. Nobody knew this, this site even existed, mm. even though the public taxes and everything had paid for it. And I started seeing anomalies. So it took me down the road of anomaly hunting, which led me to start seeing anomalies that looked like ancient structures on Earth. And I was able to make the connection between the Atlanteans being a uh, an interplanetary, maybe even intergalactic civilization using the same exact master architect techniques. And I realized then that these civilizations were actually one and the same. So it was a mind blowing experience. And I can only take from it that that's that's what the purpose was. Yeah, and and this is now an, a, a field that you that you've called archaeoastronomy. Yeah, putting those two together, it's like analyzing the space anomalies that you found and seeing you know what's actually going on with the yeah. structures, the ancient structures related to the planets mm-hmm. and related to all these different things. Like it's amazing how the the pyramids align perfectly with some constellations. Yeah. Uh, if if you wanna if you wanna enlighten us on that. Yeah, it's amazing. The pyramid, the Great Pyramid, for example, it's a multifunctional stone computer. It has these shafts, which I just got done crawling in those shafts a few days ago. Huh. <laughs> I took 70 people to Egypt with me, and we went temple hiking and shaft hiking inside of pyramids. But these shafts, they align with star systems and constellations on different time periods during different processions of the equinox. And we find that they align with specifically Orion, Aldebaran, um, Sirius, uh, you know, Zeta Reticulus. And so we're like, what are these alignments for? When you analyze what those shafts are connected to in, in the interior of the Great Pyramid and how they partially connect to the Queen's Chamber, we begin to realize something. Mm. We, I personally believe that the shafts are part of a communications device, which is just one of the technologies built into the Great Pyramid that has specific star alignments Back then, water used to run underneath the Great Pyramid, and there are giant dried-out aquifers to prove this. Mm-hmm. The Nile was much closer. That would create physiostatic electricity, which would put ions, pull ions up into the Great Pyramid, up into the King's Chamber, and then it would be used for wireless power. But also, some of that water was transmitted to go in and down into the Queen's Chamber, which I believe was an electrolysis unit. It would, it would electronically separate the hydrogen from the oxygen via electrolysis, which we know because we have we have the same capability today. We do the same thing now. Yeah. And then why hydrogen? Because the number one purpose of hydrogen in astrophysics right now is for communication with ET. We try to communicate on the hydrogen frequency because we believe that it's the most widely used frequency in the universe for communication long distance. Mm. So I believe that those hydrogen those shafts were shooting out hydrogen encoded with information about the updates, what's going on on Earth, and what their civilization is doing. We're okay down here. This breakaway civilization is starting to blossom, wherever the case may be, right? Whatever the message was. Yeah. But they would shoot those messages to those star systems to communicate with their relatives or ancestors. Hmm. And I wanted to get into when you were 
connecting with the aboriginals uh here on on earth is the species that's been mm -hmm. widely disconnected from modern civilization yeah. and Oh, you've been with them and one things one of the things that i love about you is that you're a field researcher like you go you. there you talk to people you yeah. you're actually physically there not just on google searching different right. things so you've gone to see this with your own eyes um which yeah. is so important and the aboriginals they're a very special uh group of people in the world right now and i wanted to yeah. to just dig into why yeah. why why are they so special well, these people are the, some of the most incredible people on the planet. Everybody's incredible, but I mean, in terms of their natural ability to communicate with, uh, you know, with telepathically, they have telekinesis, they have, they communicate with animals, they can navigate based on Earth's magnetic field. I mean, these people are incredible people. And it's really a shame kind of what's happened to them in more recent times with the modernization of their, of their area. But mm -hmm. um, I went there. Uh, I think it was uh, the beginning of 2020, right before the whole shutdown happened. And I got out there when the fires were there. I was trying to get to this Egyptian, uh, this makeshift Egyptian uh, hieroglyph and carry on nine called the Gosford glyphs before they burnt down. Yeah. We got out there. Luckily, the fire still never got to those, but they did get to another cave we were trying to get to and burnt that, destroyed that. But we got to these glyphs. These are proto-Egyptian hieroglyphs in the middle of the outback. And on one side is Egyptian, on the other side is uh, uh, is actually um, Pleiadian, according to the Aboriginal people. Mm -hmm. And so the Egyptian side, which is really, uh, it was before the dynastic era, so these are Kemetic glyphs. That's why they call them Proto-Egyptian. They're before Egyptian, but still Egyptian-ish, <laughs> so yeah. to speak. And they've been dated now, 5,000 years, because in between the glyphs, you can take that organic material and you get it dated. It was dated, and it dates back to 5,000 on both sides which is pretty interesting. Hmm. On the Pleiadian side, there's a gigantic, what looks like a mothership with little tiny ships coming out of it. And according to the aboriginals, that was a ship that came here with little ships coming out and they would come and interact directly with them. And I said, well, why would they do that? Why, why you guys? They said, we were the first people seated on this planet by the Pleiadians. And that's their verbal handed down history for thousands of years that the aboriginals were the first, not the last, but the first seeded on this planet and that this planet was an abandoned seed colony. Hmm. Pretty interesting stuff. I mean, just wild, mind blowing. Yeah, I just got chills while you while you said that. Um, and Billy, since a very young age, you've had this sort of futuristic mindset where you're able to look into what's next in multiple different industries you know we we yeah. talked about the dot-com industry mm -hmm. um now in the media industry what is going to be next in terms of technology for humanity mm -hmm. right now well we're going to be moving into frequency healing a lot sooner than people think frequency healing is the next big thing uh isolating for example a uh, a, a grouping of cancer cells and then obtaining the subatomic frequency and the vibration of the atoms that make that cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And then creating a frequency that matches to cancel out those cells. So you destroy the cancer cells without destroying any surrounding tissue. Just like if I put a wine glass in front of you and I bring a famous singer in, there's one lady, she used to do it a long time ago, and pe people can do it now, certain opera singers can do it. They would sing at a resonant frequency to the resonance of the atoms in the glass and shatter the wine glass, but everything else around perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Same exact principle. I'd love to go deeper on that. So that is it, yeah. is it beginning with sound? Is is it like producing sounds that are able to heal people from different illnesses? And what else can it be applied right. to other than uh, other than health? Oh, it can do a lot. There's a lot of science data already that exists. Uh, a lot of it done, believe it or not, in Russia, where they have been able to rewrite and re-encode DNA, trigger it to re-encode itself, I should say, via sound frequencies. And they've done, been able to do it 100% with 100% accuracy over and over again. Very duplicatable experiment where they realized that even rewriting DNA uh, and also rewriting epigenetics through sound and frequency. So we can now talking about, we know that a human being is holding 15 to 20 years of epigenetic memories. Mostly, most of those memories are trauma, traumatic experiences passed down through the RNA. Wow. Now they're talking about wiping out kind of like that Will Smith thing from the uh, Men in Black where he mm -hmm. hits you with that light and you forget everything. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, kind of doing that to your genetics and like wiping out all that bad genetic memory, giving you a fresh, clean slate through frequency and sound to give you a fresh start to rebuild your own new untethered memories from the past. Pretty wow. interesting stuff. We're talking about creating a new human, man. One that can be so that can recognize its own power in such a great way that uh, it's going to change civilization altogether. Yeah. And, and I know there's a lot of people now that have done a lot of work to heal those traumas at a later mm -hmm. age, whether they're doing plant medicine, whether they're doing yeah. you know therapy, whatever the modality is. But if a human being is able to clear themselves of ancestral generational trauma from birth, what are the implications mm -hmm. of that? What, pow implications what powers are, are we unlocking, basically? Oh, we're talking about tapping back, tapping back into everything, util utilizing our uh, our magnetite crystals in our brains to navigate the magnetic field, tele telepathic capabilities, telekinesis, psychic capabilities. You know, all these natural innate capabilities that we're supposed to have past our five senses. We're talking about all that programming is what's turning it all off. It's all programming code because the human mm -hmm. body is nothing but a robot. Once you release that code and open us up to all the amazing possibilities and everything that we're capable of doing, and we're having the knowing that we're capable of doing it, it's going to create and transform humanity like you just wouldn't believe. Yeah. And, and you mentioned the magnetite crystals inside of our brain. Yeah. And, and I also heard you talk about how, you know, a lot of things in our environment are shutting those capabilities down. The magnetite crystals essentially for, as you mentioned, navigation, a lot of Right. species a lot of wildlife has that where they can <laughs> know that there is going to be an earthquake and then get out of yes. there and we're the ones like getting <laughs> fucked over right there because we didn't even hear the the call um but essentially yeah. the magnetite crystals at that point is the environment still an influence uh if we're able to do the whole emotional energetic work the environment is still an influence. However, we're able to see beyond the veil and we're able to realize, oh, we have the power to change our environment. Mm. And so one of the biggest things I think that's going to happen is a lot of the divide and conquer tactics will stop working uh, once a lot of that trauma is cleared and that people will come together and join together and realize, oh, we're better working as a team. We're going to just change this environment. We are the masters of our own destiny, of our own future. We're going to fix this problem. We're going to change it to this. We're going to replace that system with this system. And now we're going to move forward. So changing environments is just as easy, easy as changing your pants once you know how to do it. Yeah. And most of the wars that the wars that are going on in the world right now are mm -hmm. rooted in race and religion. This yeah. divisiveness, these tactics. And we even hear in, in the legend of the Tower of Babel when mm -hmm. we are separated and divided and um, kept yeah. from that unifying potential that we have as humans to come together and create extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, um, these divisive tactics, how can we see beyond what is going on in the world right now with the fear porn yeah. that is going on, mm -hmm. um, the news, the, all these things, how can we see beyond yeah. that and tap back into our power? The first thing we need to do right now is the biggest thing people can do is turn the news off. You know, you can still get news without watching the news. I get news all the time. I know everything that's going on, but I'm not watching the news. The news, <clears throat> it's programming, which is the right terminology. Programming is programming you in a way that it, uh, that uh, raises your cortisol levels, spikes your fear. And once that happens, they can mold you and bend you at will. And so the first thing I would do is turn the news off. If you want to get specific information, do like I do. You create a specific feed on your uh, online or you go to specific blogs and you say, I only want to see this, this and this. And I get my physics updates. I get some general uh, news updates, something general stuff, nothing too deep that's going to destroy my insides. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you begin to realize that a lot of that stuff that's got you afraid is what's keeping you away from your brother or your sister. Right. And in, in, in humanity. And then the second thing is start looking at everybody as if you are them. As it's hard to do. I mean, everyone, you know, people who are the most what we would consider to be saints and people who are we consider to be even the most evil. Mm. You have to look at every single person and realize that they are actually you from another perspective. And uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to be best buddies with everybody. But at the same time, you're going to respect, you're going to honor, you're going to love every single person that exists on the entire planet. 
and you're not going to let some third party programming come in and keep the divide and conquer tactic moving forward. And when people start realizing that everybody's all the same person from different perspectives, and you realize that when you're talking to somebody, like I'm talking to you, I'm really talking to myself. And when you're talking to me, you're talking to yourself. So how would you talk to yourself? Talk to someone as you would talk to yourself. And you begin to realize, wow, that adds another level of respect and dignity, which is really missing a lot right now. And then all of a sudden, you're going to start to see things begin to change. And when people realize that they were better together than apart, and analyzing again, I have to go back to biology. If we strip all of our skin away, we all pretty much look the same underneath. And so people have this predisposed thing in their brain about this race and that race. That's okay to be proud of your race, your ethnicity, or whatever you are. But at the same time, understand it's just a small part of a larger thing. If we travel from here to another planet, when I land and they say, where are you from? I'm going to say Earth. I'm not going to say I'm from Boca Raton, Florida, uh, the you know the, the zip code such and such and race such and such. Yeah. I'm just going to say I'm an Earthling. And so when we start to see the bigger picture like that, it'll become a lot easier. Hmm. And someone who was really able to do that, you know, that walked Earth was Jesus, Yeshua. And I wanted mm -hmm. to, to get into that topic because yeah. there is something a lot of people don't know is that he left the Bible for some time and they didn't really tell us where he went so i think it was since yeah. he, he was 12 years old they didn't tell yeah. us where he went um where did he go and where did you find out that he went there yeah absolutely that's a great question a lot of people don't realize that yeshua uh at the age of 12 the, aka jesus is what he's known in modern times uh at the age of 12 he disappeared like you said disappeared from the bible completely well where was he he went to egypt and the proof of this is like when I take my people to Egypt, right? Or when I go, I always go to Coptic Cairo, where the original Christians exist long before Jesus was even born. Christianity already existed for people who didn't know. Hmm. Uh, it was actually ushered in by Pharaoh Akhenaten, monotheism, a one God type of religion system. But anyway, in Coptic Cairo, the house that he lived in is still there. It's now a Coptic church. The bed, everything is still there. It's a shrine now that anyone can visit anywhere in the world. You just got to get a passport stamp and show up, and you will see with your own eyes. This 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 person was real. It wasn't a fairy tale. He actually did exist. Yeah, He was there with his mom, actually, for some time. And what did he go there for? He went to study and learn the Egyptian mysteries. He was an adept initiate into the Egyptian mysteries. Then he traveled to Tibet to learn Reiki healing, Qigong, uh, healing with his hands. Uh, that was confirmed by the Dalai Lama. Then he went down into India, where he learned the mystic arts, teaching reincarnation all, reincarnation all the way back. And you can find evidence of this in a little-known scripture named the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, which is omitted from the Bible for obvious reasons. <laughs> but well, what uh, would be those reasons? He went to learn the different mysteries. Well, the reasons were because then all of a sudden you realize that he went to go learn the devil's work, Egyptian mysteries, which was really the teachings of Thoth the Atlantean. So anywhere in the New Testament where you see Jesus speaking or quoted as saying something, in my book, I have this, the Thoth's words from the Emerald Tabith and Jesus's words side by side, where you can see he's saying the same thing that Thoth was saying 36,000 years ago. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? Either he is a reincarnation of Thoth or he's learning from the same master. Uh, so he's just regurgitating the same words or it's him. One of the two. That's the only two options you have. Uh, so it's pretty interesting, man. It's pretty powerful mm -hmm. stuff when you really dig into it and realize, wow, this man did exist. He really was on a mission to bring peace and enlightenment to the world. Unfortunately, when it came down to the canonized version of the Bible, his words were twisted, changed, altered, uh, and uh, a little bit of salt was put in there you know, for the control of the masses. However, if you look at the original context of his message, yeah. it's pretty sound. Yeah. When I was in history school, they told us that Mesopotamia was the first civilization in the world. Um, and now we're talking 36,000 years ago. I had never learned about the Sumerians. Uh, yeah. I, I recently found this out um, when I read Zachariah Sitchin's book. And I know he's regarded in your eyes as one of the best researchers um, yeah. out there. And what did he discover and what's so important about knowing that history spans out so much further than we were taught in school, yeah. in the history books. Oh, absolutely. The reason why people in religious, uh, uh, you know, in the religious arena believe that the earth is only 6,000 years old is because the Bible and other religious texts were written from ancient Sumerian tablets, which date back 6,000 years old. 
So that's where the 6,000 comes from. Mm -hmm. All those stories are copied stories. Zachariah Sitchin was amazing in that he was able to find existing translations. Another lie that came out of bottom was he was the only person that could translate the tablets and he made it all up. That's actually majorly false because anyone who could just do a basic search on the information about the tablets will discover they were just they were translated before he was even born. Uh, and he found these amazing translations. And in his books, after every so many paragraphs, he tells you the source of where he got the information in his actual books. So these people never even read the books. But anyway, he discovered the Sumerian tablets uh, were written a very long time ago and then copied over and over again onto more tablets. And that the original story dates back about 450,000 years. When you look at the Sumerian Kings list, which I went to go see in person, I got tired of hearing about it. I got tired of listening to YouTube videos about it. You know what I do. I hopped on a plane. I took my butt to the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England. I walk in with my cell phone camera, which I have a great video clip of it. And I got as close as I could to that thing and took a great 3D photo going and wrapping around it. Hmm. It's got the Kings list. Kings on there ruling antediluvial before the Great Flood. For one king ruled for 28,800 years. One king ruled for 14,000 years. I mean, the numbers are, the ruling years are just mind-blowing. Because and of so the all, lifespan like, of these rulers. The lifespan is hundreds hundreds of thousands of years. Eons, yeah. you know? Yeah. Eons. But one reason, Thoth gives a clue as to how they're able to do it. They have something called Halls of Amenti. And they have these rejuvenation chambers, this technology that allows them to transfer their consciousness from one body to another. They make their own body. They don't take anybody else's body, according to the text. They make their own bodies, probably some type of cloning technique they've got. They make their own avatars, I should say. They're avatars. Mm. And they say that they walk amongst men, but unlike a man. They can be walking around right now. We wouldn't even know it. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> How's everyone doing? <laughs> <Just kidding>. How's <laughs> um yeah and and when when we look at those ancient scriptures these beings that were ruling at the time they were seen as godly in a way they were taller they yeah. they weren't essentially human at that time when there were there are other beings living amongst us right Li walking mm -hmm. the yeah. earth with humans who are those mm -hmm. beings these anunnaki atlantean people were some of them were massive uh they talk about in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, they, they call them the Anak, not the Anunnaki, but they're called the Anak. Same same version of the same word, different version of the same word. And they said, we were grasshoppers in their eyes. That's how big these people were. These people were 10, 15, 20 feet tall, massive beings. They came from a planet four to, four to six times larger than Earth. Uh, and they came here in a very, very ancient time. Over time, as, the, as we move forward closer to the present day, their sizes shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk till they became almost what would appear to be an average person. They were very distinguishable, though, in the text, in biblical text, in, um, uh, in ancient tablets and cylinder scrolls, as well as papyruses, because they always had these huge heads. Their skin was different. Their eyes glowed. These people were clearly different. You can tell uh, which one was either you know not from Earth and which one was from Earth, even though we had a lot of similarities as hominids. They had six fingers and six toes, uh, you know, and all that kind of cool stuff. So pretty interesting. <laughs> very interesting. Very interesting. I wanted to read a quote because obviously you are an innate researcher and true to your work in the sense that you're going out there um, and you've been reading since you were one, one year old. And yeah. there is a book that you had. There is a quote that you had in your book that said, read and be wise but only if the light of your own consciousness awakens the deep-seated understanding, which is in, an inherent quality of the soul. What does yeah. that mean to you? Oh, man. It means that when you read this information, be wise to understand. This is going to literally affect and change everything. Your entire paradigm is going to shift. If you're paying attention, and you're really analyzing and discerning this information. And that if there's, if there's darkness in you, it can bring that out. If there's light in you, It'll bring that out. So be careful when you go into this. Have your right, have the right mindset. Have the right positive high vibrational mindset. Don't take this information and utilize it or see how you can be used for darkness. See how it can be used for light because it is going to give you a paradigm shift. And it's so powerful 
the masters of our reality right now, these elites of elites, they've learned the stuff that's in this Emerald Tablets and everywhere else. And they've figured out how to utilize it to control and move the masses in whatever direction that they want. They're like puppeteers. Mm. This information is so powerful, it can brighten you and it can enlighten you and it can take you to another, another level consciously. Uh, but if you let it seep in and you want to be dark, it'll do that as well. So you have yeah. to understand it is going to bring out in you what's in you. Yeah. And and whoever is here right now, obviously, seekers of wisdom. And I wanted to ask just to leave people with some resources. Of what are some of these forbidden books that you would recommend people to like start with if they want to go oh, yeah. deeper into all of this work, which is mm -hmm. it goes deep down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. It goes deep. It goes deep. You know, one of the books that really gave me an understanding of how our current political system and our, our current financial system with inflation and everything else, The Gods of Eden by William Bramley. That book is going to blow you away. The Gods of Eden by William Bramley. It's going to give you an understanding of exactly how we got to where we are right now today in 2022 hmm. and how the inflation is operating because it all got installed thousands of years ago. And it talks about how it got set up, how it was installed, and how it's propagated now into the future. It's very clear. Hmm. Uh, so that's one that I would read. Also, I would probably read the um, the uh, Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation. A lot of people don't realize that the book of uh, Genesis and the Bible, a lot of the text that talks about the beginnings of time here and this so on, to create this planet and everything else, it all comes from the Enuma Elish. Yeah. And so uh, they took a very small portion of it. The bigger version of it's there. Uh, and I would also look into the Epic of Gilgamesh. If you want to know the true story of Noah, uh, who Noah's father was, who was Enlil, who was Gilgamesh, King Gilgamesh. He was half human, half Atlantean Anunnaki. The hero's journey he went on, they fabricated an artificial uh, man to go on a journey with him, like an R2-D2 type of a character. This is incredible stuff to be talking about, you know what I'm saying, mm. thousands of years ago. Uh, and also, of course, the Book of Enoch, which he was obviously an important person in the Bible because he's mentioned several times, but his book was kept out. Yeah. When you read his book, you discover that aliens came from space to earth and engaged mankind, taught us how to make weapons, how to make war, how to be battle strategists, uh, and other various things that they taught us, but they kept it up because it was specifically talking about beings from somewhere else coming here and engaging mankind and giving us this technology and information where we didn't have before. Mm. So pretty powerful stuff. Those three things are, and oh, one last one, the myth of Adapa, so you can find out how powerful we truly are. Yeah. And we'll leave for people that are listening, we'll, we'll leave everything in the resource section of the show notes or the description if you're on YouTube. Um, I want to leave people as we start wrapping up with two of the concepts um, from you that I've heard that really resonated, which is you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make them drink because you're thirsty. So obviously yeah. we're here, we're, we're engaged in this uh, knowledge and people that are listening and tuning in um, mm -hmm. that they're following and resonating. You know, one thing is to seek this out on our own and then the other thing is to push it onto other people which is the immediate yeah. reaction right this is also mm -hmm. <laughs> i feel a little yeah. bit hypocritical because I, I host a podcast where it's like yo <laughs> listen to this <laughs> but um some of the things that you gain when you go on this journey are unutterable as you said the highest knowledge yes. is unutterable so he who talks does not know he who knows does not talk so essentially mm -hmm. what i got from that um when i heard that from you is go on your own journey yeah. accumulate all the wisdom all the knowledge all the information that you can make sure you understand and make sure that you're reading in between the lines because you've also said you show an imbecile the moon and he points at the finger right so it's <laughs> letting people know that all this yeah. information like you can read the emerald tablets like we'll also <laughs> link your book but yeah. if you're not reading in between the lines of what they're saying and interpreting it from a pure space without biases, mm -hmm. without judgments, without what yeah. religion has told you, without what science has told you, without what your teachers have told you, then mm -hmm. it might get misinterpreted. And then that's why we have a bunch of battles all over the world and wars about yeah. misinterpretation of history 
and it's mm-hmm. incredible um, to to just just grasp that concept. And and that was really powerful when I heard you say that. Yeah, mm. appreciate um, it. Yes, uh, powerful stuff, man. <laughs> deep. Yeah, it goes deep. And and Billy, b- yeah. before we wrap up every podcast, we have a segment called the Final Trio which are mm-hmm. rapid fire questions you can answer in any way yeah. that you want. But before that, mm-hmm. where would you send people to go deeper into your work to find out more about you? If you have any exciting upcoming projects that you'd like to drop, please make sure to do they that. They just go to, uh, everyone can go to 4 bidden Knowledge, the number 4, 4 bidden yeah. Knowledge yeah. Dot com, or B-I-D-D-E-N, get to get the 4. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on there is everything. I'm linked to everything there, all my social media, my TV network, uh, blogs, everything that I'm doing, all my tours that I'm taking people on around the world, everything's there. Awesome. Awesome. Now for the final trio, this is one of my favorite <laughs> sections mm-hmm. of the show. Um, okay. The first one is what is the greatest forbidden, forbidden key that will <laughs> enable us to penetrate beyond the veil, beyond the illusion of separation? I think the, the biggest forbidden key is unconditional love. It really is. It sounds so simple, but it seems to be so difficult for most because our emotions and things like that get in the way, our distractions get in the way. But really, truly feeling an unconditional love for every single entity on the, that exists on the planet, but not even entities, not even people, even inanimate objects, because everything is conscious. Even a microphone that I'm talking on right now is conscious because the atoms in there are conscious. So treating everything with a certain level of respect, unconditional love, it will, it will give us the ability to respect one another and everything that exists in a third dimension. Yes, I love that. The second fi- uh, question is more of a personal question. Um, I heard you say once that the only tattoo that you would ever get on your body is a voice imprint of the last words of your mother, Ingrid mm. Carson. Is there anything yeah. that you'd like to share with us about what that tattoo would have looked like if you ever got it or if you if you don't? Wow, <laughs> you went deep on that one. Yeah, it would have been a voice print of her, you know, with the, the lines there. The oscillations and um you know she just told me how proud she was of me it was on her deathbed she said she you know she loved me and she was so proud of me the man that i've become and the lives that i was changing and that she wished me the best and uh she said that you know i was a great son to her and i, I you know mm-hmm. in hindsight uh technology wasn't as great back then with cell phones but if i could have just recorded that that would have been the only tattoo i would have ever gotten her voice print which would have read out but if you decode it it would have said exactly what she said yeah and and yeah. I know that she was a very integral part of your journey because yeah. she believed that Machu Picchu, the Nazca lines, were ancient airports. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that was one of the driving factors behind all your research and all the travels yeah. you've done. So just wanted to make sure we acknowledge her in, in this conversation. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. The last question is going to force us to travel a little bit into the future. Um, okay. And... It's basically, if I were to give you a time capsule, mm-hmm. and this time capsule, the intention was that the future generation of leaders, the spiritual teachers of the next generation, the presidents, the CEOs, you know, the business shakers, all mm-hmm. the future leaders of the world are going to open yeah. this time capsule um, 10, 15 years down the line, 20 years down the line, and you could put anything in this time capsule whether it's a voice Mm -hmm. recording a book a painting anything Mm -hmm. that you would want to put there you know imaginable quantum possibilities what would be inside this time capsule i believe i believe a diagram in there for a whole new type of a political and economic system and that system would be a very simple simply laid out uh that uh, we would utilize all the advancements we've had in technology to free the burden of man. And so that the burden of man would be free, but not that they would be out of a job because Mm -hmm. jobs wouldn't exist, that we would empower people to follow their passion and work in places for free because they love and they love, they like what it is and they love what they do and free up other people to travel and experience and experience arts, crafts, life. And your status in life is how good you are at what you do and how well you help others. I would put together that whole plan of a new system of economics that really is a system based on 528 hertz powerful powerful stuff and and also just to encourage people to continue researching going down their own path of seeking wisdom 
Is there anything that you're researching right now that's really catching your eye and your mind that you'd encourage people to go down even further as well? There's a new tomb that was discovered in Saqqara, which I've been looking into because I'm trying to see if I can get access to it for 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, this tomb, it shows the life of a high priest in Egypt. It's a two-story underground tomb near the halls of Amenti. And I want to see if there's any evidence or any information that's linking or my theory of Enki's Halls of Amenti to this priest. He would have well had knowledge of it. So I, I can't wait to try to get down there, get access to this underground um, uh, crypt and see if I what information, what knowledge I can gather and talk to some of the, the scientists and the anthropologists. Just to see if I can help make my case stronger yeah. for the Halls of Amenti at the Serapium. Can, can you go into the Halls of Amenti now? Sure, yeah. So the Halls of Amenti were talked about, the first time I heard about it was in Thoth's Emerald Tablets. Yeah. Uh, he talks about having these great halls underneath the Great Pyramid, which were discovered a few years ago, extending out about a mile underneath the Great Pyramid, under the sand, gigantic halls. These are alcoves, really. And inside of each one were these megalithic sarcophaguses, which he called rejuvenation chambers. And he would put a body in there to let it rejuvenate for 100 years while he walked around in another body, and he would, vice versa, he would transfer from body to body, which is why he was known all around the world as different people, but really being the same person. Enki, his father, had the same exact halls. I believe they were located at the Serapium underneath the sands in Saqqara, which I've been to many times. Again, giant halls or really alcoves carved out underground. Looks like the stone has been vitrified, carved out and vitrified at the same time it was bored. Uh, and these alcoves go in these 90 degree angles hmm. and inside of each one is a hundred ton sarcophagus that's completely empty. No dead bodies, no animal parts in there. They were part of a technological system. These alcoves are so tight that these hundred ton sarcophaguses, would, a sarcophagi would have to have been teleported into the spot. You can't even maneuver them down and get them into the location. Yeah. Uh, again, more evidence of high technology. And I believe that because it's, it's uh, attributed to Enki, that this was his halls of Amenti where he would exchange his bodies so they can continue that long lifespan. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And I mean, history repeats itself. And right now, as we're seeing, the elites are showing interest yeah. in transferring their consciousness after yeah. They've been their doing physical it. body. They dies. successfully transferred a monkey into a computer. It body's dead. The monkey's alive inside of a computer. They've they've connected. Wow. DARPA has connected a soldier's consciousness to a field robot. And so just like the Avatar movies, same exact scenario. When the field robot dies, they have the, ro the soldier just gets up. Uh, and now in 2045, the 2045 project in Russia, they're working on transferring into a cloned body, your full consciousness into a cloned body with no disease, no illness, you know, long lifespan and all of that which they're probably uh, are pretty close to right now. So this is all stuff that we're doing now, but we just learned it from what happened in the past. Wow. Billy, I, I would definitely love to do this again because I know we only scratched the, <laughs> the surface, the tip of the iceberg. Um, you're a wealth of knowledge, brother, and Thank I you. truly appreciate and honor the work that you're doing in the world. It's so game changing, Thank you. especially for our young Thank generations you. that I believe you're going to change the history books with the research that you're doing. So thank you, man. Appreciate you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Much love.